If you can read and like Superman, your favorite Superman story is probably Superman that won't end up! All Star Superman, a timeless work of art that pushes the entire medium of comics into the realms of respectable literature. The film then cuts out five of the 12 issues for its limited 70 minute runtime. And that's alright. Both opens with the same bullet points that distills Superman down to his most essential, understandable elements doomed planet, desperate scientists, last hope. Kindly couple. Superman. So immediately we're made aware of how mythic his basic and essential ingredients are and how familiar we've become with Superman stories. Lois even writes her article about him saving scientists before it even happens. We don't know that yet, Lois. I always write Superman stories before they happen. And Lex, as expected, is behind it. He's already in prison, in fact. I'm getting older. He isn't. The world of All-Star Superman has a very specific retro pulpy style where the goofiest people and things can happen, while the science is really specific and imaginative. Like when Dr. Leo Quinton presents a Voyager Titan designed for deep space voyages, nanonauts that shrink down to understand the mysteries of the cell and atoms. Quinton wants to escape a doomed planet. Humanity's past, a dream inspired by Superman. The purpose of all of this is to present a world where looking up to Superman isn't about worshipping a god, but daring to be curious, daring to be imaginative. A world that's in the process of becoming a utopia. You are our inspiration, Superman. But then Superman's exposed to too much sun, tripling his powers, killing him. Something, something, something changing your mind. Oh, I love Superman. <laughs> Superheroes are not real. Breaking news, I know. And instead of trying to make them real, why don't we embrace their impossibilities to give ourselves the imagination to be better? All-Star Superman is about many things, but what personally really touched me was its complete and total subscription towards this. Superman is the man of tomorrow because he can accomplish anything, and in doing so, he teaches us to dream bigger. And I thought, really, the, the basis of Batman for me is Batman always fights death. Superman always fights the impossible. All while being a really nice guy, because the comic is also a character study of someone who should be cynical. He's dying and there's nothing he can do, but in Superman's final days, he continues to be naturally compassionate. There's a cut moment where Superman stands in front of a mirror, struggling to figure out how to tell Lois he's dying. And as he slouches in the Clark Kent way, the mirror still shows Superman standing. The disguise is the ideal. Well, I could see how you'd make the mistake, but despite this great bot, I'm not Superman. This, this is what's important to him. Being human, experiencing a sense of everydayness, which includes insults and being ignored by the woman he loves. But not today. Today, Lois learns the truth. Through her, we see his beautiful man cave that's a museum and an art gallery. She sees his descendants, one who looks like her father. Superman also has a baby sun eater, incredibly dangerous, but he looks after it. What do you feed him? Suns. Little ones I make here on my cosmic anvil. Grant Morrison and Frank Whiteley really masterfully present Superman as both the sun god and as the simple, kind soul living in a world that isn't always so agreeing with him in very harmonious proportions. Lois's birthday present is then the gift of being able to spend a day with his superpowers. Then they bump into Samson and Atlas, who both want Lois, pissing Superman off. What do I have to do to make you keep your hands off of my girl? This is where the comic and the film begins to diverge, not in terms of cut contents, but in terms of the actual characterization of Superman. James Denton may say the mostly accurate lines, and the animation does a great job in simulating Frank Wiley's art, but the performance itself is way sterner and doesn't really have the soft and friendly presence from the page. Just look at when Borel points out Superman is puffing out his chest. In the comic, it's true, he looks like a kid acting tough. In the film, it's more of an insult that Superman's genuinely intimidating presence isn't working. But you don't have the best interest of this planet's people at heart. And this is you puffing up your chest. As a result, the stuff with Samson and Atlas, Superman comes off as being very weirdly possessive. I don't like you much, Samson. Anyways, Superman answers the unanswerable question to save Lois, because these two jerks lured the bad guy over. What happens when the irresistible force meets the immovable object? 
they surrender. Superman then breaks with their arms. As the day ends, he puts Lois to bed. Unfortunately, the film also removes Lois talking about being able to smell the trees in Canada, seeing gorgeous radio waves and hearing the stars singing. She got to see the world as he did. And from that, we learn that Superman may appear innocent, soft and naive, you know, a big kid, but this isn't actually a flaw. He's informed by so many things that we can't even comprehend. He sees and hears more all the time. It's a truly joyful way to live. The next part is also just entirely cut. Issue 4, where Jimmy Olsen saves Superman by turning into Doomsday. The black case Superman was everything you're not. A bully, a coward, a liar. And I'm sure Jimmy Olsen sounds exactly like this. He's a good kid, made in Superman's image, and... I don't know, I guess it makes sense to cut. The film instead jumps straight to issue 5. Clark interviews Lex. You write like a poet. But you move like a landslide. Lex actually likes Clark. He respects his skill as a writer, and since he's a buffoon, he sees him, ironically, as the sort of man Superman's very existence mocks. In a world without Superman, you're humble, modest, comically uncoordinated. The unattainable Lois Lane might have noticed good old Clark pining away in the corner. Human. In short, you're everything he's not. You keep talking about me, but I'm here to interview you. I'm just saying. A strapping farm boy with brains, integrity, and no discernible style of his own. You're a prize catch for a cynical city girl. But with him around, you're a parody of a man. A dullard. A cripple. Lex hates Superman, because here's a god who's natural in all of his strength, who invites people to sit with him. And that contradicts and devalues Lex's pride as a self-made capitalist god who looks down on other people. Therefore, altruism to Lex is the ultimate failure of imagination. Alternatives? To truth, justice, and all the other things you can't weigh or measure. However, there is goodness in Lex. When Parasite escapes to try and suck off Clark, Lex tries to protect him. If you want to survive this, Stay with me. His obsession with being strong could have actually manifested itself as a need to protect the weak, but he's too darn in love with the story he's written for himself. The story he wants Clark to write. He doesn't want the world to know he's dying, of course. So break the news gently. There's a few things I wish they kept, like when Lex talks about how 65% of men subconsciously trim their eyebrows to look like Superman, and this really passionate expression Clark makes when he tries to emphasize it didn't have to be this way, but as an adaptation it's rather splendid, especially since it makes Lex less vitriolic. He doesn't take every opportunity to insult Clark. It's such a waste. You and Superman could have been friends, and instead you're going to die. Ah, but he'll die first. Therefore, you really feel the tragedy of this bold man's wasted life. A life which Superman can see the potential of every time he looks at him. And also, it prepares the film for ultimately a different payoff with the character. They also cut out issue 6, where the Superman squad from the future arrives on the day Jonathan dies. Clark, as a result, questions what's the point of his powers? What's the point of anything if he can't even say goodbye? But he actually did. The bandaged Superman from the future was him and he got three extra minutes. It's an incredibly beautiful and smartly constructed issue. But I guess I gotta get rid of it because we've seen Jonathan die loads already. The next two issues, seven and eight, are also cut where Superman escapes Bizarro World. He meets Zabaro, a one in five billion anomaly, who's a poet and actually like a normal person. He wants to leave too, but Superman can't risk his life but he promises to contact him if he makes it back and inspires him with some really powerful words. Why else did this world, this incredible organism, make eyes like yours to see beauty and meaning where others see chaos? In the film, Superman's like Poochie. He just abruptly leaves after breaking Lois's heart. We can't have children. Our biology is too different. It's very sad, but in 2024, there's actually a lot of comfort in seeing super happy man, family man. Anyways, in the missing months, Lilo and Barrel, legendary Kryptonian astronauts, tears what Superman builds down. They dismiss Jor-El and his son as ineffectual dreamers. You could have built a new Krypton in this squalor. But it doesn't matter. They're dying. But despite their cruelty, Kal-El looks after them. After everything we've done, you still show us kindness. They give Kal-El permission to save them the only way he can. The Phantom Zone. In the comics, issue 9 specifically, there's this really satisfying full page where they stand above the inmates, bringing order. So for them, this isn't punishment, it's a task. Another big adventure, as they say. The point of all of this is that Kryptonians can be arrogant, but they are noble people. Dreamers that look to the future, qualities Superman inherited instinctually and has inspired humanity to follow. 
while at the same time he also carries humanity's humility. He's experienced love, work, grief, and values kind action. He doesn't just dream what civilization can be, but what people can be. Humans, bizarros, and Kryptonians alike. This all culminates in this incredibly beautiful issue that's also totally cut. Superman's last usual day. He visits dying children, frees the Kandorians on Mars with the help of Dr. Quintum, and to see if the world can go on without him, Superman created one to study. Our world. And we created our own Superman with a paper and a pencil. And my parents were terrified of the bomb. So when you're a little kid, that's the scariest thing in the world. Right. And then I discover Superman comics and Superman can walk out of a nuclear explosion laughing and his suit isn't even scorched. So suddenly for me, imaginatively, there was a thing that could defeat the bomb. And it was called Superman. If the bomb started as an idea, so did Superman. He can be a better idea. He's not just here to fight the bad guys, but he's here to hug us. Tell us we're stronger than we think. Lex gets zapped, but he drinks the super serum beforehand and starts killing everyone. He's been secretly working with Solaris, the asshole son. Luthor's secret ally has finally revealed himself. As a result, Earth's son is now poisoned, so Superman leaves with his robots joining him out of loyalty. The Sun Eater also aids, but they're all killed. So Superman is so angry that he takes the opportunity his friends gave him and tears Solaris until he pleads for mercy. And in the film, he replies, I don't think I have any left. Which is pretty f***ed up, because that's actually the exact opposite of the comic, in which he says, by the 24th century, I'm told you'll have been rehabilitated to work with humanity instead of against them. Rehabilitation begins here, Solaris. Lex attacks. Clark enters the afterlife, where we have one of my favorite Superman scenes ever. Which the film, of course, cuts out. Superman wakes up on Krypton, where Jor-El explains how, because Kryptonian cell structure has adapted to store energy, Superman's death is actually him mutating to a new stage, solar radio consciousness, because matter cannot be destroyed or created. He will enter a higher existence. Kal-El can either surrender to this process, or go back one last time to fight evil. The choice is rather obvious, but jor tries to give his son a break by eulogizing what he's done. You have given them an ideal to aspire to, embodied their highest aspirations. They will race and stumble and fall and crawl and curse and finally, they will join you in the sun, Kal-El. In time, you will no longer be alone. Man of Steel took the speech and ultimately repurposed it as a set of instructions, which doesn't really make a lot of sense, because seconds before, Jor-El talked about how Krypton fell apart due to its lack of free will, so of course now he's giving orders? What if Henry Cavill just wanted a simple life, bro? What are you gonna do, tell him he can't? I don't know. The point is, this speech is a beautiful moment that highlights just how unassuming Superman is. The only thing that's on his mind is to concern for others and accomplishing the next great feat. The sun is poisoned. Don't you get it? Solaris double-crossed you and poisoned the sun, you vain, stupid little man. Lex cares more about the insult than actually doing something about it. But then Clark wakes up, increases Lex's personal gravity by 500 times, which accelerates his 24-hour superpower serum, because gravity is connected with time. Everything is connected. And Lex, like Lois before, finally sees everything the way Superman does. He can see the universe is indifferent, because like it or not, Everything is connected, but that also means all we have are each other. And this is how he sees things all the time, every day. It's a cruel joke. The mechanistic clockwork of reality hinging on a precious, impossible defiance of entropy, on life. And the clockwork doesn't care. It's like, like it's all just us in here together. As Lex cries and realizes, Superman kisses Lois for the last time. His last great feat is flying into the sun, purifying it. Time passes, Lois believes he's coming back, and Lex accepts his imminent execution. But he tries to make things right just a little bit. He gives Quintum the Kryptonian genetic map he reverse engineered. Of course, it will require an ovum from a healthy human woman. In the comic, Superman actually did that, alongside instructions on how to combine human and Kryptonian strands, which leads to the most important Superman line of them all. This is how much I trust you, Leo. Thank you, Superman. Thank you indeed. As a result, comic Lex is just kind of described as being faded and small. But either way, the future is secured. There is a Superman too. The world is saved from its past by the man of tomorrow. 
In the comics, Superman's last great feat is looking after us, even after his death, making sure we're taken care of. In the film, his last great feat is turning someone with so much hate into someone who believes. This also Superman film, I think, is the best movie they could have made under their 70 minute conditions. Dwayne McDuffie took a pretty episodic series of adventures that also had very strong metatextual themes to them, exploring how Superman is the conjuring of our greatest versions of ourselves, and was able to turn it into a more cohesive drama about redemption, love, and being a nice guy. What's consistently removed are parts of the story that concretely show the promise of a better tomorrow shaped in Superman's image, while at the same time the film puts a highlight on the pre-existing Lex Luthor stuff so his redemption can give the loose series of events a stronger emotional frame, a more powerful payoff to something set up earlier on. Consequently, up close, these two pieces of media are about different things. In one, Superman's great final feats are examples of the impossible. He's not just a person, but a dream, the face of tomorrow. In the other, his great feats are things Lex could have accomplished too, if he cared enough. And the fact that he wasted his entire life so many times makes that all the more tragic. You're right. But that also creates a different satisfaction to the fact that it's him that secures Superman's future. But I certainly had a similar feeling between the two in the end of the day. We can invent so much as human beings, and the idea we would conjure someone so much better than us to lead our imagination and work so hard to keep them alive, that is truly a precious thing. In Superman, some of the loftiest aspirations of our species came hurtling down from imagination's bright heaven to collide with the lowest form of entertainment. And from their union, something powerful and resonant was born. Albert in its underwear. He was brave, he was clever, he never gave up, and he never let anyone down. He stood up for the weak and knew how to see off the bullies of all kinds. He couldn't be hurt or killed by the bad guys, hard as they might try. He didn't get sick, he was fiercely loyal to his friends and his adopted world. He was Apollo, the sun god, the unbeatable supreme self, the personal greatness of which we all know we're capable. He was the righteous inner authority and lover of justice that blazed behind the starched shirt front of hierarchical conformity. In other words, then, Superman was the rebirth of our oldest idea. He was a god, his throne atop the peaks of an emergent dime store Olympus, and like Zeus, he would disguise himself as a mortal to walk among the common people and stay in touch with their dramas and passions. I'm gonna end this video with that big quote from Grant Morrison, Super Gods. Because of course I would. Making these comparison videos, what can I say?